Hi, I'm Amber Moriwu. Thanks so much for joining me for the next half hour to hear about the art and science of estimating or you want it when? A little bit about myself before we get into things. I've been in the San Francisco Bay Area for quite some time. I've worked at a number of startups. More recently, I moved to Atlassian, who uh, make team productivity software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello. And I've been helping teams estimate, let's just say, for many years. I even use estimating in my personal life. I have a Trello board that tracks the home improvements I want to make, and I have a couple of columns. One's a high effort, one's a low effort and a high effort. I have kind of those half day or longer, you know, long term tasks that I need to work on in that low effort column. I have those things that are just kind of like a one to two hours. I could get them done later in an afternoon. So estimating can be used in your personal life as well as at work. So have you ever been in the situation where a senior executive has come up to you and said, so I really want this marketing website to be done, this five page website, and I need it done in the next three weeks. And you're like, oh my goodness, internally like, you want it when? <laughs> I mean, and maybe they came up to you over Zoom. I get it. We're all you know, remote these days. But what I'm hoping to do over the next half hour is to give you a way to choose process over panic in that situation, give you some tools and techniques to be able to have a really good conversation with that executive and come back and manage expectations to live up to what the company needs to have done. So the things I'm going to be talking through today, why estimate in the first place? There's two units of estimation that I'm going to share with you. And I'm going to talk through six different estimation methods. Now, there's definitely more than that, but those are all we have time for in this uh, half hour conversation. Uh, and I'm going to then help you understand how would you choose between those different techniques? You know, what are the parameters you're thinking about to choose the right estimation method? I'm going to talk through velocity, what it is, how to track it, and some guidelines to keep in mind when you're using velocity. And then I'll wrap up with a few final thoughts. But before we get into things, I want to share with you the concept of the project management triangle. Let's talk through it. So it has three corners to it. It has time, which is how much time you have available to finish a project. It has cost, which is really resources of people, how many people you have available to work on something. And then finally, it has scope or quality. You know, is it a five page website? Is it a 20 page website? What's the scope of the work that we're doing? Now, you'll find in any given situation, at least one of these uh, corners is fixed. When, that mark, when the executive said to me, you know, I have this website and you're done in three weeks time, it sounds like time is fixed, but it may or may not be until you have a conversation. So the conversation you could consider having is, uh, so you have a three week deadline. I'm wondering what's motivating that deadline. Is there a, you know, an event or something that's making that a hard deadline? The answer might be, yes, there's an event. We need it done in three weeks. Great. Time is fixed. So you have resources or scope to potentially negotiate against. Or they may say, no, I just want it done fairly soon. Three weeks seems reasonable. You're like, oh, okay, great. So is the timeline more important or is the scope making sure we get all of those five pages complete in that time period, which is more important to you? The project management triangle allows you to have a negotiation with somebody who's asking for work to make sure you end up delivering what they need and delivering to their priorities, but also managing the workload and the effort for the team. So why estimate? Why is it a good use of your time? Well, what it first does is it gives you data-driven expectation management. Uh, it helps you forecast for expected costs or like how much time and effort is this going to take. It helps you think about dependencies. You might identify there's a partner team that needs to work on an area of code that they own that you need to contact and they're part of that you know, process to help estimate. Um, you also are going to be helped with project stability. It'll help you think about risks and misunderstandings. Perhaps there's a software license that you need to purchase to achieve this and that's stuck in finance or we're waiting on approvals. So that risk is going to be identified. And maybe you'll figure out a way to mitigate and escalate that to get it through finance to get the project done in time. Then finally, it helps uh, the team workload to make sure you avoid burnout. If you're estimating well and you're making sure you're not overloading the team with too much work in a time period, you can have a happier, healthier team who's going to stay around and work with you for much longer. There's two different estimation units you can use to estimate. The first one is absolute, which is time. And the second one is relative, which is complexity. Let's go into those a bit deeper. Absolute estimation or time, it's measuring units of person hours or days or months. So it's what we're really familiar with, right? We know time. It's when you go to a meeting, it's what's on your watch, etc. Time is really familiar. So it's a very comfortable unit for people to use. You're thinking about who's going to do the work. Are they experts in it? Have they done this before? Or are they going to need to ramp up and need some additional time to get familiar with the information of the code base? 
Is anything going to distract them? If it's a contractor working on something, every billable hour is going towards your project. If they're working 20 billable hours, that's 20 hours in your project. Versus if it's a full-time employee, they've got other things to do. They've got company all hands to go to. They've got career development to work on. So if it's a full-time employee, I always think of them as being available at 60% of their time. So going back to our you know, three week timeline, which is 15 days, 60% of that is only nine days of that person that we actually have available to achieve the project. Things to consider when it comes to absolute estimation, uh, that it's really easy to understand, but time can sometimes give a false sense of precision because it sounds really precise, right? Uh, my manager might say, how long is it going to take you to do that report? And I say, it's going to take me one hour. My manager comes back in one hour, one minute time and says, are you done yet? And I'm like, ah, not quite. But one hour sounded really specific. So time gives that sort of false sense of precision. It works well if it's a known repeatable task that you've already done previously. So, no, you know, fairly easily how to estimate against it. But time, you can only add more people to a project so many times before you can't break the work down into smaller divisible tasks. And the ultimate example of this is uh, nine women can't work together to make one baby in one month. So you can only break tasks down so far and then that's the scope that you're going to need to go with. So let's do a little example here. Somebody has to go to Starbucks and get a coffee to bring it back. How long is that going to take them? So for me, I live in San Francisco in a fairly urban area. My Starbucks is a couple blocks around the corner. Um, so thinking about that, I'm like, ah, there and back, a couple of blocks. It's about 12 minutes. Okay, let's tuck that 12 minute estimate in the back of our heads and come back to it after the next section. Relative estimation or complexity. Things to think about are it's not just effort. So time was just thinking about effort. It's also about risk, things that can go wrong, and complexity. Is it simple or are there a lot of moving parts involved? You think about uh, size in comparative terms. Is it bigger or smaller than this? So some of the units you can use are t-shirt sizes, story points, dog breeds. Yes, I'm not kidding. Is it a chihuahua or is it a large golden retriever? I haven't seen anybody use dog breeds for estimating, but it sure would be fun. Most people use t-shirt sizes and story points. Some techniques you can use uh, when you're doing relative estimation include poker planning and affinity mapping. I'll get to those in a few more slides to explain those further. Uh, but things to think about is it's harder to conceptualize than time, uh, and it needs some alignment within the team. What does a small, medium, and large mean between a team? You need to align over time and say, let's look at these three you know, different tasks and let's align and, okay, we think this one's a small, this is a medium. Once you have that agreement, it becomes easy, but it does take an initial alignment process to get there. Story points. They're a value system for relative estimating. They usually use the Fibonacci sequence, which is what that visual is here, the one, two, three, five, eight, et cetera. Uh, the raw values are unimportant, uh, the relative values are what matter. Now, why use Fibonacci? That's because the more complex the task is, the more room for error exists in estimating. And you can see how this exponentially gets bigger uh, as the values go up. It's not to be compared to time. Instead, you're thinking about those three things again, the amount of work to do, which is the effort, the complexity of the work, and the risk involved. And when you're thinking about it, a five is just, when you're estimating a five story point, it's just more than a three, but it's less than an eight. So it's all relative. Is it bigger or smaller than this? That's what it's about. For people who haven't used this before, it's common to start with t-shirt sizes uh, and compare them to story points. So you might draw out and say a one is an extra small, two is a small, three is a medium, etc. People always seem to be more comfortable with t-shirt sizes at the start. So that's a way to get people used to using the system. Let's go back to our exercise now. Going to Starbucks, bring it back. Well, what you didn't know is I live in a building that has an elevator which breaks down sometimes. So uh, there's some risk in the elevator being broken down. So that might increase you know, the time, how long I think it's gonna take. Maybe I go to Starbucks and there's a long line that I hadn't anticipated. Or perhaps my drink is actually fairly complex and the barista may mess it up the first time and I have to go back and say, can you make this again for me? So when you start thinking about more than just effort, but risk and complexity, you can see how adding those extra components can help increase the accuracy of your estimating. So thinking about that Starbucks again, uh, I'm thinking it'll probably take me anywhere from maybe 12 minutes, but maybe up to 25 minutes. So I'm going to think about that in more of a range of time. 
Okay, we've just covered the two estimation units. Now let's move to the top six estimation methods. The first one is planning poker. It's a relative unit. The product owner or the person who's requesting the work talks through the work items or user stories and answers questions. The team, the engineers, designer, and so on say, explain this to us, what about this, etc. They clarify the work and then the team votes on those, uh, those uh, tasks. Now, the team does that simultaneously. So we say, maybe we're using our fist to vote. You can use poker cards, there's physical poker cards, but you know, if you just wanna be simple, you can so three, two, one, vote. Maybe one team member votes a two, somebody else says a five, that's okay. That means it's a conversation. This is called a clarifying conversation. Team member who says two says, yeah, I've worked in this code base before, it's super simple, blah, blah, blah. Team member says five said, yeah, but what about this other thing and these other risk areas? And so they have a conversation between these two people to explore why they have a different opinion. And through that, they'll clarify the work involved. The team will revote. Uh, maybe they come up with a two, maybe a five, maybe a three. It depends upon how that conversation goes, but it helps the team align on the work that's involved. So when you start that sprint and you bring that story into the sprint, you'll have had that conversation. The work will be a lot clearer because of that. I really like planning poker because of the conversations that are involved in doing the estimating process. Another way to estimate is expert judgment. So that is the person in the room who has the most experience in that particular area or what's known as a subject matter expert. So that person's just drawing on their general expertise in their area to say, based on my expertise, I think it's going to take around about this long. So this tends to be a time estimate. Next up, we have affinity mapping. Now, affinity mapping looks like this diagram here. Um, you have these, th uh, these columns which show extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large. And you put all the tasks off to one side. And then the team silently gathers around the board, virtual or in person, and moves the tasks into the column that they think they're in. And they're saying, is this task bigger than this one, bigger than the, this one, or smaller than this one? And they'll put it in the right column. Now the teams may change and say, no, I disagree with you, I'm moving it over here. Any task that moves around too frequently, you put off to the side and have a conversation at the end. But usually the majority of the tasks you'll align as a team and you just have a few ones to have a conversation about at the end. This is super effective. You've had a lot of tasks to estimate. You can see it's a fairly quick way to align on the effort level and complexity and risk of these tasks. Next up, we have comparative or historical. So similar to expert opinion, but a little different. The expert relies on a person's knowledge. The comparative historical looks back on projects that have been done in the past. And so the whole team says, gosh, we've done another marketing website previously, which was a seven page website versus this five. It was this level of effort. We think it's gonna be this. So it's another time-based type uh, way of estimating. And then finally, there is the top down and bottoms up technique. So the top down, uh, you do a high level breakdown of the work in the project. Um, it's fairly low investment. So you say, I've got the five page website. Um, it's five pages. It's got this number of graphics. That's about how much time it's going to take. Versus the bottom up or work breakdown structure, WBS. You go into a lot more detail. You estimate for every task in the project. You don't just say it's got this many graphics. You're like, okay, it's got a database back end. It's got this form you fill out. You basically break it down to all the tasks you're going to do. It takes a lot more time. Um, and then make your estimate from that. Now, we're human. We always miss something. So for both of these, I suggest using ranges and potentially also adding some sort of contingency budget because it's good to have a little bit of padding just in case you're a little bit inaccurate in your estimating. Okay, so I've talked about six different techniques. You're like, Amber, how on earth do I choose between all these different techniques? Well, you're going to ask yourself, is it a small project or a large project? And do I have not very much time available or I have enough time available to estimate on it? And each technique more naturally falls into different categories based on those questions. So if it's a small project, not much time to estimate. So that five page website probably falls into that. You might use expert judgment, comparative or historical or top down. Those are all fairly fast ways to estimate. If you don't have a lot of time, but it's a larger project, you might add to that and put in affinity mapping. Remember, that was a fairly fast way to estimate on a lot of tasks at once. If you have a lot of time, uh, but it's a smaller project, you might consider using uh, another couple of techniques, planning poker or bottom up. They take more time, but probably gonna increase that accuracy. 
Or if it's a large project and you have enough time, then I think affinity mapping or poker planning are going to flesh out those conversations, make sure you reveal any unknown risks and concerns and dependencies and really help to get to the most accurate estimate. Each of these lends themselves more to either waterfall or agile as a technique. So waterfall tends to be time-based estimates and agile tends to be those relative uh, based estimates. Finally, let's talk a little bit about velocity. So velocity is the rate of progress of a team. How much work can they get done in a time period? Yay, Jira tracks this. There's velocity uh, reports in Jira. Uh, and the way you measure velocity is you average out the last three sprints, how much work the team completed in the last three sprints. It does take a few sprints to normalize. You can see this is a brand new team and they're getting faster over time. And a change in the team composition will change that team velocity. You'll kind of, you'll reset how you're measuring a velocity. So to dive into this chart in a little bit more detail, the gray line here is showing you how much work the team thought they could do in that time period. And the green line is showing how much work they actually did achieve in that time period. Now you can see over time, at first the team uh, thought and achieved 25 points in their second sprint. They estimated 40 points and completed 50. They're really kind of revving up their engines there. The third sprint, they're amazing and they did over 70, estimated over 70 points and achieved around about 80 points. So you would take these three green lines, the values of those round, you know, average them out. And you probably had to come up with about 50 points is what you should estimate for the next sprint. And then each sprint, you look back to the last three sprints and estimate uh, you know, what that velocity is going to be based on the average of those three sprints. Now, this team has been increasing their velocity over time. They're going to flatten out <laughs> or burn out one of the two. Uh, and so you're always looking back to those last three sprints, but back to remember if there's a change in team composition, there will be a change in velocity. Keep that in mind. There are a few charts uh, beyond just that overall uh, sprint velocity chart you can look at. There's the burn down chart. So a burn down chart shows the work mapped against time. And it shows the progress towards the sprint goals. Uh, and keep an eye out for when the red line goes up that shows more work. So let me explain this a little bit further. This left axis here is the story points and the right axis is time, how many, how many days are in the sprint. This gray line shows you how that work is supposed to burn down over time, how much work is going to get achieved over that time period. Then the red line is the actual work, the number of story points that are being completed. Every time you move a task into complete, that red line is going to go down. So you can see this team is actually achieving. They're ahead of schedule and it's kind of flattening out here, but this is actually a really healthy burn down chart. You may see a burn down chart, but that red line goes, I call that flatlining, <laughs> not a great thing, but this is great to check halfway through the sprint to say, are we achieving our goals? How are we doing towards that? Are there blockers that we need to think about to help remove? There's also the concept of a burn up chart. So the concept of this is it's the work completed against the total amount of work available. Now the axes on this are, this is the number of stories that you're supposed to be completing, and this is the number of sprints you have. And this, so this is the work that the product manager or the person requesting work has put in. So the blue line is showing the number of stories that need to be completed. And you can see that red line over time is how many stories are actually being delivered. And this will help you with your um, showing that value being delivered. This will help you track your progress towards a release plan. Is this red line trending towards the date? Were you hoping to finish by about sprint 10? Or were you hoping to finish by sprint 7? And you're like, oh, based on this trend line, we're not going to get there. Final thoughts about velocity. It's not comparable between teams. It's like comparing the Japanese yen to the US dollar. Those are two really different currencies. And story point uh, velocity is also like a currency. It's what's agreed upon within a team is to the value of a 135, etc. And maybe a three in one team is a five in another team. So this team is doing 40 story points per sprint. This two team is doing 60 story points per sprint, but they're really having the same level of output. So don't worry about each team's velocity. Just look at the output and do you feel like they're achieving enough over time? Team velocity should be measured at the team level only. Agile is a team sport. Never measure the individual team member's velocity. It's against the philosophy of Agile to do that. Finally, a couple of bonus thoughts. Teams slow down when change happens. When you change the project they're working on, there's a ramp up time. When you add or subtract a person, even when you add a person to a team, you're like, oh, they're going to speed up. Well, they will, but not immediately because 
they're helping to ramp up that new team member. That team member doesn't know what's going on. So they'll slow down a little bit before they speed up. So whenever there's change, velocity is going to drop for a bit until it goes up again. All work has some level of uncertainty. So I always recommend when you're doing estimating to ideally use ranges when you're expressing how long it'll take for doing to do something until you've actually started working on it. You've gotten kind of a track record, have a better understanding of what, the, what that work is. Ideally try to express things in time ranges. Finally, overtime really hurts productivity. Uh, let me show you a chart to describe that. This line here shows the uh, average team velocity over time. So it's a straight line. This is how much work a team can reasonably get done in a regular 40 hour work week. Over here, we're showing, you know, that three week website while wow, the team just has to crunch that there's a hard deadline. We can't add people to it. So we're just going to ask people to work extra hours. And so the team's crunching. They're delivering a lot more work over time. Great. OK, we hit. Oh, we hit that deadline. We delivered on time. The team's super tired. They haven't seen their family and friends in forever. They need some time off to recharge their battery or they come to work. They're just like they're surfing the Internet because they're just tired. So whilst you may achieve more work in the short time period when you're crunching, you're going to lose that time in the longer term when the team needs to recharge. So just be aware if you are asking a team to work over time, you'll need this recharge time. Okay, finally, who should be involved in the estimating process? Well, unless you're using that expert judgment technique, I recommend that all team members are part of the estimating process. The reason being, it creates more buy-in. If I went to a team and said, okay, we've got three weeks to do this marketing website, go. They're like, WTF Amber. <laughs> we weren't involved in an estimate. We don't think it can be done at that time. They're not going to have any buy-in and they're not going to care. Versus if it went to the team and said, hey, let's estimate on this and talk with the stakeholder about what's involved. And they go and they say, well, it's really this length of time. Once they've given me that time estimate, they've got some buy-in and commitment to that. And I can hold them to that commitment. I can say, you estimated this. This is what I'm expecting from you. So ideally, whenever you're estimating, make sure everybody in the team is involved in the estimating process. So we're coming to the end. How did that marketing website end up? Well, you heard at the start, I had the conversation with the executive about is time fixed or uh, you know, is the scope fixed? What's more important to you? I knew resources were fixed. I knew we didn't have anybody else on the team. And I found out that the uh, time was fixed, but we could deliver a smaller part of the website during that time. So we used a top down way of estimating, realized that five pages in that time period wasn't realistic, but we could deliver three pages. The executive agreed to that. So we delivered that three pages in that three week time period. We were able to deliver the rest of the scope five, you know, in the five to six week time period. The executive was happy because we managed their expectations as to what was able to be delivered. They knew that what they were getting, but we were able to meet that deadline they needed for a specific event. We all lived happily ever after. So I hope I've given you some tools and techniques that you can take back to your work life and put into practice to help you estimate better, manage expectations better and have better team health over time. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, if you want to talk with me live, I will be at the US uh, after party, which is on June 13th, 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. I'd love to see you there and love to have a chat with you. Have a fabulous day. Thank you.